invite you to turn to Matthew's Gospel as we continue our study in this great Gospel of our Lord. Last week we looked at the summary of our Lord's public ministry in Galilee to the north and that area where it was the crossroads of the world in, in that day. Uh, and we saw that there were three things that Jesus did, as Matthew gives us, he, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Secondly, he called disciples to himself. And thirdly, he healed uh, everyone from every disease and from everywhere. And now we come to the first main block of teaching. There are five main blocks of teaching in Matthew's gospel. And we come to the first one, and we know it as the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, 6, and 7. And there's a possible continuation of this uh, new Israel theme that we've been seeing in the first four chapters, uh, a, a kind of a new Moses thing, the five not coincidental, five uh, blocks of teaching as there are five uh, books of the law. Uh, Jesus is going to be going up into a mountain as Moses went into a mountain. Uh, some have pointed out that he's giving a new law there uh, to his people. Uh, and although this is a possibility, we must remember that chapter, verse one, we're going to see that he went up into the mountain in response to seeing the crowds and that implies more than just Moses. It, it implies that Jesus was separating himself. He wanted to go up into this mountain area, um, perhaps stop the healing for a time, do some teaching, and that would be something that uh, would be difficult for people to bring sick up the, up the mountain side. It was for those who, who wanted to know more, for people who wanted to uh, learn of him and, and grow in their faith and find out more about what the kingdom is all about. And then secondly, we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount that, that Jesus doesn't give a new law. He explains and expounds the law of God, the one and only law of God. He's explaining how this law fits within the, the kingdom and a new expression of the kingdom of God that has drawn near in him and, and is right upon them as, as he speaks. And so the Sermon on the Mount has been called the, the, a Christian manifesto of the kingdom of God. Uh, another person put it, uh, the charter of the kingdom. It is a description of disciples of Christ. And I'm going to emphasize this over and over again because I think it's misinterpreted by some because they've missed this point, that it's about what a follower of Christ is uh, all about, what a follower of Christ looks like. And so it's spoken, as we're told right from verse 1, to disciples, and it's spoken about disciples. Uh, Michael Green put it this way, the new age has dawned and the sermon shows what human life is like after repentance and commitment to the king. Jesus had just been preaching, uh, repent and come into the kingdom. Uh, he went on to say a word uh, or in a word, life is very different. The injunction, do not be like them, which we'll find in chapter six, verse eight, encapsulizes the tone of the Sermon on the Mount. A sharp contrast is constantly drawn between the standards of Jesus and those of others. Here we meet a distinctive lifestyle with radically different values and ambitions. Everything is at variance with those outside the kingdom. We're gonna see this back and forth. Uh, as we go through. And so the Sermon on the Mount is not a code of ethics that Jesus is giving for all humanity. It's not meant to be that. It's not a code of ethics for all of society in general to follow. It's a profile of citizens in Christ's kingdom. It describes them. And therefore, what Jesus says is not just for the people of Jesus' day, uh, it's for all disciples. It's for the disciples of Christ. It's not for, as some have interpreted the Mount, as something of a future era. It's about that. No, it's, it's about the now and the not yet. It's about those and for all those who have come to Jesus and who hear the announcement of the kingdom and repent and turn to him. It's for those of us who trust Christ. It tells us what we are, what we're becoming, and what we will be and what we will have in the future. And therefore, the, the sermon is totally countercultural. It's about and for believers. 
And so hear the word of the Lord as we come before him this morning. And uh, we'll be looking at the Beatitudes, but we're not going to be able to cover uh, all eight of them this morning, uh, probably just six of them. But this is the word of the Lord. I'll read the entire uh, first uh, uh, 12 verses. This is God's word. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So when's the reading of God's word? Let's, let's pray to him. Let's talk to him. Let's ask him to help us. Well, Lord, we do come to you knowing that this is your word. These are your people. This is your preacher. This is your church. And Lord, speak to your people through your word today, we pray. Go beyond uh, what uh, we could do humanly together. By the power of your spirit, work through the means in which you have set aside and the means in which you love to use to bring us into your presence and to meet with us. Lord, may we hear your voice today, the shepherd's voice, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. It's always been true but now in an age of uh, identity theft and uh, microchips, it's all the more true that we must be ever ready to prove who we are to someone else, to show that we are who we say we are. It used to be you have to show your papers, and that's still true with ID cards and passports and whatnot. But now we have to know our numbers, don't we? those numbers, those pin codes, those passwords. We either have to know them by heart or we have to know a very safe place to put them because we shouldn't ever forget them, right? Well, how do people know and how do people prove that they are believers? How would you prove that you're a believer in Christ, that you know Christ? And that's a big question. It's beyond really the scope of this sermon, but it brings us into what this sermon is talking about because part of what we know is to compare ourselves with this sermon. Part of the way in which we know that we're Christians is we look at the sermon here and particularly these Beatitudes and we say, is that me or not? And so this is what Jesus intends for this sermon. And why is this? Because Jesus is outlining and identifying who the blessed are, who the favored are. That's what that word means. Who the favored people are. Who are the favored people of God? Who are no longer under the curse anymore? And so we, what he gives us is eight marks of a disciple in the Beatitudes. Eight marks of the disciple. Kent Hughes put it this way. He said, the Sermon of the Mount shows us exactly where we stand in relation to the kingdom. As we expose ourselves to the x-rays of Christ's words, we see whether we truly are believers. And if believers, the degree of the authenticity of our lives. No other section of scripture makes us face our sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. And so these Beatitudes to whom Christ shows us, shows us who belongs to the kingdom. They open and close with the same promise. For such 
are the, theirs is the kingdom of God. That's the focus. Who's in the kingdom? Who's a part of the kingdom? Who belongs to the kingdom? Sometimes these, these word blessed is translated happy, right? You've probably heard sermons with that use that. But I don't believe that's fair to say that. We've sometimes heard uh, even the, uh, the idea that these are the be happy attitudes, the, the eight be happy attitudes. No, no. Happiness has something to do with our emotions. Happiness is about how we feel. Happiness comes and goes in our life. It's a wonderful gift of God, but it comes and goes. Jesus is talking about something much more permanent than that. Jesus is talking about something that is lasting, that is certain, blessed. He's talking about who is approved of God. Who belongs to God? Who's under his rule? Who has entered into his kingdom? Blessed is, is not an attitude. It's a possession. It's how we, are we standing in, in the presence of, 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 of God? And our, how do we measure up to that? And so he gives us eight blessings. And that's why these eight blessings are a unit. They all go together. They are all talking about the same person. They're talking about the same disciple of Christ. They're talking about the same kingdom. They're not eight different kinds of disciples. They're not eight different degrees of being a disciple. There aren't eight possible qualities that disciples could have. They are definitive descriptions of disciples. And so the eight blessings are just that, they're blessings. They de- describe the disciple. They're not commands. We can sometimes read them that way. They're not commands. They're not, Jesus is not commanding us to be poor in spirit. He's describing who a disciple is. They don't tell us what to do or how to do it, but they do tell us who we are, who we've, we've, we've come like, who we're, we're, is like this is a disciple. And if we're not like this, we simply aren't disciples. It's that clear. If we're not having these qualities, we just aren't disciples of Christ. We're, we might be interested in being a disciple of Christ. We might uh, like many of the qualities and, uh, and, and highlight them in our lives. But, but Jesus is showing us the characteristics of his disciples. And so you'll see that he gives two things. He does two things in each of those Beatitudes. He identifies who are the blessed, and then he gives a reason why they are blessed or a result of being blessed of God. Notice how different this is from outside the kingdom. That Jesus is describing really a new humanity here. James Boyce was good about this. If we wrote the Beatitudes, if we were the people who are blessed in this world, he said, left to ourselves, our natural Beatitudes would go something like this. Blessed are the rich, for they have, all, have it all and have it all now. Blessed are the happy, for they are content with themselves and don't need others. Blessed are the arrogant, for people defer to them. Blessed are those who fight for the good things in life, for they will get them. Blessed are the free spirits, for they will have a good time. That's the way our world would, draw, would write the Beatitudes. But Jesus does something different here. He's showing us what the kingdom is like, what a disciple is like. So let's look, I'm gonna go through briefly these, these uh, six of these t- together. Blessed are the pure, poor in spirit. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, Favored are those who are poor in society. Or favored are you when you lose your job. Or favored are you when you are homeless. He's talking about being poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Now you may know know your Bibles. Well, know that in Luke's version of Jesus' sermon, it doesn't say in spirit. It just simply says, blessed are the poor. And people have run with that without comparing scripture with scripture, which we should be doing. But there's a background to this. The poor in the Old Testament were known as those who were not only without, but they were people who cried out to the Lord. They were known as, as the people who needed the Lord. And so the psalmist in Psalm 34, 6 says, this poor man, he's not talking about being penniless. He's talking about being dependent upon God. 
as opposed to the rich who would think, I don't need God. I have everything that I need in life without him. And so this beatitude is saying, blessed or favored are those who know they have nothing to offer God. Absolutely nothing. Blessed are the bankrupt before God. Blessed are those people. It, it, it's a sense in which the disciple, true disciple as we are, declare our spiritual bankruptcy before God. And this is illustrated so wonderfully, even in the prayer we had earlier in the service of the, of the tax collector, remember, and the Pharisee that went up to pray to the Lord and how the tax, uh, the, rather the Pharisee said, God, thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Can you imagine? Our hearts have done it though, haven't we? I fast twice a week, I give tenth of all my income. But when the tax collector stood, he stood at a distance. He would not even look at the heaven. And he said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. This is what Jesus is talking about. People who know themselves poor in spirit, who are destitute before him, spiritually destitute. Those who have empty pockets and poverty souls. The world, of course, thinks differently than this. Blessed are the rich. Blessed are the self-confident. Blessed are the self-indulgent. Blessed are the self-reliant. Blessed are the self-satisfied. Blessed are the self-assured. Blessed are those who follow their own path in life and find their own way. Blessed are those who think nothing of their sins, who who redefine those sins so that they are faultless. But the poor in spirit say, nothing in my hand I bring, bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I'll die. That's the poor in spirit. And no one can be a believer without this spirit. And everyone who has this spirit ends up a Christian. God's kingdom belongs to them and only to them. Or secondly, blessed are those who mourn. And again, we ask, what does Jesus mean by mourning here? Is he talking about all mourners? Is he talking about blessed be those who are sad in life, who suffer loss in life? No, remember the context. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, not to the world at large here. These words fall on the heels of of knowing yourself to be poor in spirit, bankrupt before God. And therefore Jesus must mean blessed are those who mourn for sin, who mourn for their own sin, who mourn for the sin of others, who mourn for the sin of this world and all its effects. You know, you may not want to hear it this morning, but part of being a disciple of Christ is to be unhappy some of the time. Not all the time, but some of the time. Unhappy with yourself. Unhappy with the way the world is going, the way the world has always been going. Unhappy with with the unrepentance of those closest to you. Unhappy with the the whole uh, way of the world. Unhappy with these things. Lately, I picked up a book that that's helped me greatly by John Stott. It's his, a collection of his essays all the way from 1959 on to uh, practically his death. And one of those articles is, when should a Christian weep? And this is what he says. He says, should a Christian ever be unhappy? In some periods of church history, it would have seemed absurd to ask such a question. These were the periods in which Christians cultivated an air of grave somnolence solemnity and earned for themselves a reputation of being very glum. At other times, including I think our own day, the opposite tendency has been apparent. Evangelicalism has been debased into the simple invitation, come to Jesus and be happy. The signature tune of the Christian church has been, I am happy. 
In a Christian magazine I receive, every Christian's picture, and there are many, shows him with a grin from ear to ear. But the true biblical image of the Christian is neither of these. There is a time to laugh and there's a time to weep, the preacher in Ecclesiastes said. Moreover, we are followers of one who went about saying, be of good cheer, go in peace, and yet was called the man of sorrows. The Apostle Paul expressed this paradox in 2 Corinthians, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Why is this? The ravages of the fall have not yet been eradicated either in this world or in, the, in Christian people themselves. We still have a fallen nature and ingrained corruption over which we weep. We still have in a, live in a fallen world full of sorrow because of a world full of suffering. Can we not, he asks this, can we not hear these things? Can we not see these things? The eyes that do not weep are blind eyes. Eyes closed to the facts of sin and suffering in ourselves and in the rest of humanity. That phrase hit me. Why can't I weep more for others? If we can't see these things, we have blind eyes. But Jesus says, blessed are those who do this. Have you mourned lately? Have you wept for your sin? Have you wept for other sins? Have you wept for the world? Have you thought about it? The disciple of Christ is blessed to mourn for sin. But there's a second part to it. They will be, we will be comforted. Is this future or present I think in all these, they both have an aspect of both. Now we're comforted. We're comforted by the gospel. We're comforted by the promises of God. We're comforted by the work, the finished work of Christ for us on the cross. We're comforted by the faithfulness of God. And the list goes on and on. But we will be fully comforted on the last day. Then Jesus says, blessed are the meek. Again, we have to ask a definitive question, a question of definition. Who are the meek? What does it mean to be weak? Meek. See, I even said weak. We think of weak and meek together, don't we? It doesn't sound very manly, does it? It doesn't sound very womanly either. It doesn't sound very nice to be meek. The, the, the word in Greek, though, meant in classical Greek, at least, it was, the, it was used to describe the taming of animals, the soothing of medicine, a mild word, a gentle breeze, all of those things was used. This is what the word meek is all about. And Jesus is practically quoting Psalm 37, 11, which says, the, but the meek will inherit the land. He's quoting that. And in that Psalm, it's interesting to see who the, the it almost gives a def- description of the meek in that Psalm, Psalm 37. Because the meek are those who do not fret because of evil men. They are not envious of those who do wrong. They trust in the Lord. They commit their way to the Lord. They wait patiently for the Lord. They refrain from anger. This is what the meek are about. The meek are the ones who trust God, not themselves. The meek are the ones who are amazed at God's grace for them. And therefore, they can be gracious to others. The meek rest in God's sovereignty and therefore can be at peace. At peace with God's providence in their lives. At peace with God's will for their lives. At peace with other people in their lives that may be difficult. The meek can serve others because they know where they stand with God. The meek are strong in the Lord yet not overbearing and overpowering of others. John Blanchard titled his his sermon on this, this one beatitude, the gentle giants. That's what this is, the gentle giants. The meek are gentle, and yet they're not a pushover. The meek are in control of themselves, and yet they don't have to be in control of others. Meek are ones who get it right. They get the, the balance right between uh, 
being overwhelmed and, and, and standing firm. As Blanchard went on to say, he said, meekness always gets the balance right. It is firm but not assertive, principled but not petty, tender but not touchy. Martin Lord Jones in his, his part said this. He said, the man who is truly meek is the man who is amazed that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat him as well as they do. It's a humble person who's strong in the Lord. And these are the people who will inherit the earth. The idea is not inheriting a bunch of dirt as sometimes joked about. It's talking about the promises of the land of the Old Testament, the promises that God gave to Abraham that, that his people would have the land and it expand into the new heavens and the earth to where God's people will one day have it all. And you would think in our world that the pushy and the privileged and the powerful, the, the vengeful and the violent and the victorious would get all that they need in the end for they have all the nice real estate now. But no, not in Christ's kingdom. Christ's kingdom is this upside down kingdom. Those who grab for it all, lose it all. And those who give up their life for Christ and the gospel, find their life in the end. The wicked are on their way out. And this Psalms 37, deals a lot with the wicked. They're like the grass that will soon wither. They're like green plants that will soon die. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. The power of the wicked will be broken. When the wicked are cut off, you will see. All oh, those are quotes from Psalm 37. Wait and see, Christian. You will inherit the very earth, it's hard to believe, will inherit the very earth, the home of righteousness. It doesn't look like it right now. We're the last people that would, would be, we chose. But by God's, we, God's grace, we are. There was a, a missionary by the name of Adoniram uh, Judson who went to Burma, which is now Myanmar, uh, and he went there one of the first missionaries sent out by Americans in the early 19th century. And when he got there, there was just ter terrible timing. Uh, they were, became at war against the, the British right there. And here he is, a British man coming in to try to share the gospel with these people. And he was put in prison, filthy prison. He was strung up by his thumbs. And he was asked in prison, and now what do you, now what of your plans to win the people to Christ? And Judson calmly replied, my future is as bright as the promises of God. He was holding on to the promise of God. He would inherit all things. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's in the continual tense. Who continue to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And part, part righteousness is, well, is a theme throughout this Sermon on the Mount. Persecuted for righteousness' sake, we saw already. Our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. We'll do rights, acts of righteousness, 6 1. 6.33, we're to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. It's, it's a big, big theme throughout. And Christ's disciples are people who want more and more. They want more and more of what they have tasted in the Lord. More and more of righteousness. Again, the question comes, what does Jesus mean by righteousness? What kind of righteousness? And since these ones Jesus are talking about are already the blessed, the favored, in Pauline terms, the justified. So the thought has to be about becoming righteous. Christ's disciples want to live rightly, rightly before God. They want to be changed by him. They want to be like him. They want to be free from sin. They want to see others free from sin. They want to see society do the righteous thing. 
Is that what you want? When you ask yourself, have you gotten off course, Christian, of what you really or should be seeking for and, and longing for? Christ's way, not your way. For Christ's will to be done, not your will. You long for the day when evil will be no more. When they will look for the wicked people and they won't be able to find them anymore. What a, what a place to live. What do you yearn for in life? Jesus says, as we do this, we will be satisfied now and in the future. Jesus is changing us and Jesus will changing, will change us. And you might at this point in the sermon be saying, well, Ron, all, all these blessings are starting to sound alike. And they should, because Jesus is describing the same person. Jesus is describing the same kingdom, his kingdom and those who are blessed in it. Well, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is a difficult one, isn't it? Does he mean that anyone who shows mercy to someone in their life will in the last day be shown mercy and forgiven of all their sins? And the easy answer is no, really. This is a description of a disciple of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom. And it's saying two things about this disciple. One, that disciples are merciful people. That's what they're known for. And the disciples will be shown mercy. In other words, giving mercy and receiving mercy go hand in hand. That's the point of Jesus, that they can't be separated. Similar to forgiveness, we'll see as we get into chapter six, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And Jesus went on to explain that one to make it very clear. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. In other words, the forgiven forgive, the forgiven forgive, the objects of God's mercy become vehicles of God's mercy. Our mercy mercy to others is not the cause God, and it does not cause God to be merciful to us. He's merciful on his own merits, but his mercy causes us to be merciful. If you've received mercy, you will give it to others. Or as Sinclair Ferguson in his book said, if we are not merciful, we cannot have received Christ's mercy. They go together. We must be merciful because God has been merciful to us. We must forgive because God has forgiven us. We, we've entered the kingdom of mercy. How can we be hardened a heart to others? How can we ignore their needs? Again, Jesus gives a wonderful illustration of doesn't need the, the parable of the, of the unjust servant, the guy who's owes this great debt and, and, and the person he owes it to forgives him. So I, I forgive you of the debt. And the man walks out and he sees a, a, a guy he lent a couple dollars to and he grabs him by the collar. He says, I want that money, I want it now. It's a powerful image and picture of what we must not do. We must be merciful. And then finally, blessed are the pure in heart. And again, we ask the question, what is Jesus saying? What heart are we talking about? Certainly not the, 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 the organ that, that pumps blood to the rest of our bodies. He's not talking about that. Nor is he talking about our mere emotions. Our world can talk about have a heart, heart, that type. He's talking about the inner you, your mind and your will and your emotions and your conscience. He's talking about the central you, the real you. This must be pure. This must be genuine. Perfect? Not yet. But fully committed and devoted and given over to God. Jesus is not talking about a sinless heart here. He's not talking about a perfect heart here. Otherwise, why would we be people who are poor in spirit and, and why would we be mourning for sin? 
Uh, A.W. Pink is wonderful. He said, one of the most conclusive evidences that we do possess a pure heart is to be conscious of and burdened with the impurity which still indwells us. That's part of having a pure heart, a heart that hates sin in our lives. And so it's a heart turned over to God. It's a heart, an undivided heart, a a non-hypocritical heart. It's a sincere heart. We are the people people know us to be. And the pure in heart will see God. Again, now and later. Now by faith, later by sight. First John 3 says, we will see him as he is. And that's not talking about Jesus. In the context there, it's talking about God, seeing God as he is. And we say, how can we see God? How, God's invisible. God's a spirit. God's omnipresent. He can't be seen in one location at one time. And yet, his people say this. That Moses saw the invisible God, Hebrews 11 tells us. Job says, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. The pure in heart see God. We see him now by faith. We see him when we turn our heart and life and and confess him for the first time. We see him in redemptive history. We see him in creation. We see him in scripture over and over again. We see God in some sense in prayer and in worship. We see God in his providence in our lives, that God was there. We see God in worship as we gather. We see God in the preaching of his word. We see God in the sacraments. And we will see him face to face, the Bible says in the future. We'll see him as he is. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said, we shall never be weary of seeing God, for divine essence being infinite, there shall be every moment new and fresh delight springing forth from God into the glorified soul. The more the saints behold God, the more they will be ravished with desire and delight. It will be like a perpetual feeding. You think of the great sights of the world, the great sights maybe that you have seen in your life. Even when people go to the Grand Canyon, they leave the Grand Canyon. They don't set up a a, a, a structure there. Maybe a few people do that. But you you go and you see it and you say, I've seen the Grand Canyon. But to see God will never be like that. The sight will be the sight of sights. The sight will be the central sight of our eternal existence. We'll never lose sight of him, nor will we ever want to lose sight of him. And, and it's interesting, 1 John 3, we shall be, it says we will see him as he is because we'll be like him, it says in that same phrase. There's a sense in which we will be so glorified. It's not like seeing God right now. We will be so changed in this resurrected, glorified state that we'll be able to be like him. Not him. Don't get me wrong. We'll never be him. The creature and creator distinction always will be there for all eternity. But there is a sense in which we will share his divine nature in such a way that we'll be able to see him in such a way that will just blow us away over and over and over again. Christian, is this describing you, these Beatitudes. Are you blessed because this is who you are? Now, of course, you're going to say yes and no, right? Yes, in some ways, and yet, no, I've missed it for a while. I've not been merciful. I've not been hungering after righteousness. I've been hungering after all kinds of other things. Come back to who you are, come back to your Savior who sets a course for you of blessedness. Come back to him today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you would help us now 
What wonderful words you've given us, words of life, words of, of rejoicing, that you have changed us, you have blessed us in such great ways. Help us now to work this out in our lives. Or if we really come to the conviction today that we are not these things. Oh Lord, may you draw us to Christ. He might change us. That we might be changed by the gospel today. You gave your life for us that we might give up our life and all that we are and, and see another life, another humanity, another kingdom, another way. And rejoice in what you do in our hearts. May anyone lost here today come to you. Anyone outside the kingdom come in today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.